All right, well, as tends to happen, my wife Ella and I were at a wedding last night in Galveston. Beautiful ceremony. And as tends to happen, we were seated according to the genius of the couple who sat us next to some very interesting folks. In front of me was this gentleman with whom I apparently went to elementary school with and he knew all the elements of the Kabbalah's tree of life by name. And uh, when he got to the crown chakra, as he put it, everybody around us had already turned to someone else and my jaw was dropped by his fidelity to the esoteric arts of Kabbalah. Anyway, uh, fascinating character and um, I'm not sure what that has to do with today's reading, but uh, it's on my mind. And so today I'll be reading chapter four uh, with that energy of just passion, intensity, and um, yeah, the flicker of a great conversation at a wonderful wedding. So chapter four, it says, I woke up early, suited up and brushed real quick while Rick traveled in his sleep. I pulled his sheets off and shook the boy up and told him to get ready. He grumbled and growled and kicked off his socks on his feet. Showtime, I said, and chucked a fresh pair of socks at him. Eventually, he suited up as well, and we stepped out just in time to a world covered in rain puddles and gray clouds, a metropolis suspended in ambivalent weather. It was a cloudy day, but I got sunshine. Surprising me, Rick already knew his way around the city. Before going to bed, he had browsed a framed map of the city to trace his own, memorizing the consonant-heavy street names that now led us to Le Musée des Beaux-Arts. Only a straight shot from where we were. But we wouldn't go in a straight line. He probably traced poorly a line or two. He didn't like routes or GPS. He preferred a good map over a phone screen any day. That way he was the one choosing the path, not the GPS. Even if we ended up with a longer route. He only needed overviews. Maps suggested potential roads, let the adventurer make his own informed decisions, as opposed to the cellular device. Rick's map, this time, as messy as it was, offered us torn and twisted roads past a World War II memorial spiral in the middle of a maze, zapped between broken buildings and a mute stray dog and a burning gas pit. That gas pit felt like the grim soul of Brussels herself. Brussels, Rick said, is the Houston of Europe. Large skyline, empty downtown, and pockets of oddity in every other corner. Rick kicked over a trash bin and revealed a chipmunk making love to a squirrel. See what I mean? We passed some graffiti, some more, then a whole tsunami of cathedrals and trains and fast food joints swashed in spray paint. And then we got to the museums. It was pretty clean inside. Sitting down patiently and calmly from the stoop of the museum, we saw the two duchesses. They had on conservative dresses, at least conservative compared to the last night's, uh, compared to last night's dark shades very similar to one another like they had shared one suitcase for their trip, even the jewelry. The four of us, sober now, exchanged international pleasantries, hugs, hey how are yous, and made our way into the museum where Rick and I purchased youth discounted tickets. They paid the full price for admission. Then Rick asked the clerk about the Dali exhibit and the receptionist responded with an apology. The exhibit opens next Saturday. Alida frowned, but we didn't let her boo-hoo about it 
and quickly shot to the new Magritte section in the museum. And to hell with the melted clocks. Who needs them anyway when you got tart green apples to chew on? We skipped over rocks and swam surreal oceans and paired up opposite of how we had entered the museum. Naturally, Alida and I kept the tea's distance between us at first which inch by inch dissolved as we reacquainted ourselves and peeked over each other's shield of insecurity. A sober dance. Finally, we were both standing side by side before a painting of an empty table. We held our breath and let the ridges of our fingernails graze one another without further commitment. Our lungs filled with museum air. Waves of it billowed to our mouths as neither of us wanted to say a damn. So we looked on ahead and put on questions and unspoken lines to the paintings and decorated that empty table with our desires, wrapped our legs with the legs of the piece, stepped back from those oils. As she moved back, I felt her shoulder brush up against mine, or maybe it was mine against hers. And suddenly, an unshakable awareness of the surrealism gloomed as if two heffalumps had cut each other's eyelids just as they were about to explain what was up with the whole damn dream upon reality bit. But before the thought could shatter me, Alida spoke. You know, I never took the surrealists seriously, but I appreciate what Breton said about people who dismissed the juxtaposition of radically opposed ideas. What was that? that a man who can envision a horse galloping on the head of a tomato is an idiot. Dude, what juxtaposition do you see in this painting? None, she said, just a table. What about the window in the back? Not enough. Table would be cooler with a tomato on it, huh? I think there was one. Where is it, I asked. I don't know, she said. It must have galloped away. She turned to me. Mikhail, right? Did I pronounce it correctly? That's right, I said, turning away from the fruitless still life and looking into the two glaciers for eyes staring at me. Hey, uh, how do you pronounce your name again? She smirked. You forgot. Nuh-uh. It was Aleda? She raised the palm to her mouth, pretended to gasp. I knew it, she said. You are forgetful. Nah, I'm just self-conscious about names. I want to get it right. You know how awkward it is to have your name mispronounced? I'm no stranger. That's why you call people dude or lady or hey. That's right, lady. It is very important to call people by their name, you know. Alida got close enough for me to see the pores of her cheeks. We were the same height. At least it felt that way when I felt our toes touch and count to 20. Teach me, I said. How do you say your name? Elida. Elida Anholtz. Most Americans mispronounce it. I'll remember, I said. You must say the name to remember. Elida. Exactly. Elida, 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 Elida. Not too loud, she screamed, cracking up. In your head. A security guard shushed us from afar. Next, we wandered into another exhibit. One about humans mixed with nature. A mix of space. Matisse's and Monet's. Lots of M's. And it was all a grand morning of minds dipped in puns, sculpted in dialogue. Alida and I got used to calling each other by our first names by the end. But when we were all outside... Talk sprung about us disbanding. Elsa was fed up with the galleries. It was in desperate need of a shopping spree. Alida, on the other hand, wanted to stop by an olive oil museum first. Said she couldn't get the good stuff back home. I would have been down to join, but I knew Rick had other ideas. So we stood there in the baking sun and cooked a little before figuring out a plan. I suggested we meet up somewhere central. Le Grand Place, Alida suggested. No, Elsa shot. It's cold outside. When it's cold outside, Rick sang, I've got the month of May. 
There's a jazz festival going on. Music will keep us warm. When Elida and I nodded our heads, Rick and Elsa, like front wheels, shook their heads and rolled their eyes. By the end, Rick was like, okay, ladies, you two have fun. Mick, do what you like. I'm going back to sleep. We got a burden. We skedaddled our separate ways, like a whole note splitting into two halves on a five-line staff. Rick pinched at his saucy's efrit. I could live here, he said, sending a fork full of meat up to his mouth. Honestly, I could live here. I smiled and shook my head and looked out at the next jazz band about to play 45 minutes of dub, bubble bath rhythms, and finger-snapping grooves. They set the stage on fire. It was another 10-piece band, sax on sax on sax, half of the band performing brass, the rest, a piano, a few winded fellows, and an operatic woman born of Gaia, with lungs like zeppelins and a mouth wider than the White Sea. Her palms seldom faced the floor, and her eyes broke not from the audience. She had captivated us and shaken us, gotten us to bob side to side. At one point, between a piano solo played with elbows and a trombone crescendo, the singer Temptress brought her mighty chest near the lynx fur rugs at her feet and shushed the cordless mic as she wagged her finger at us. The audience became one, and we lowered ourselves and put down our phone toys and popped our knee joints to get low. We were waiting for something, and only she knew what was about to happen. Together, the piano man's elbow, still on the bass keys, and the wet lips of the brass section sucking in air made the air feel tight, and the tendons of our feet tight. The other men on stage held kisses to mouthpieces. The Lady of Gaia launched into a wide jumping jack and spread herself thin and let loose a marvelous howl. And the crowd cheered. We clapped our hands and the Lady Goddess sang louder than the speakers could hold. The stage started falling apart. Bolts and nuts popped out. Some lads next to me got slapped in the head. A single fry firecracker shot off and made the same Viking beast cry. The drummer closing with a bum 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 finale. A wheeze could have been heard in that breathless crowd. The band thanked us for the opportunity and took a bow. If, the singer warmly whispered into the microphone, you want their attention, you must entertain them. And she walked off. Between other bands, bigger bands, wilder bands, I wondered about Elida. I searched for her. Rick not far behind, trudging through the crowd, purple light from the Grand Place illuminating but I couldn't find her. We probably should have exchanged phone numbers. What a mess. How did folks find each other before? And there she was. Elida had her hands in her sports jacket pockets. Elsa, next to her, sipped on a carton of rosé mixed with ice water. They had just come from a cheap dinner at Rue de Boucher. They let us know that this taste was still in their mouths. Rick told Elsa she looked like the drink in her hand. She kneed his hip, then suggested we do something fun. Alida, I'm tired of walking around. I need to sit and drink, and it's my turn to pick. Rick chucked his tray of taters and turned to her. What do you want? Of course, Elsa had something else in mind. She suggested karaoke, so karaoke it was. Alida and I followed Elsa and Rick who knew where to go, while well, I watched as Elida took out a stick of gum from her jacket pocket and offered me one. Does my breath stink? I asked. She replied, maybe. Or maybe my breath stinks and my intention is to make you believe your breath stinks. And we got kicks out of that and stopped thinking so much and locked arms to march to the spot. There was a Blanche special, two for one, so Rick got the first round eight beers, and we found a booth tucked between the stage and the bar. I'm thinking of a number between one and ten, Rick said. Can you guess? Elsa leaned in. Five? You win! Now you have to talk 
about yourselves first. Turns out the two of them had grown up in a small town a few hours outside their capital. They were now in their late twenties, had been friends since childhood, like Rick and me, though the two ladies had lived totally different lives. Elsa was as casual as Elida, just as friendly, but could snap at you at any moment with a witty, gotcha sort of apostrophe in conversation. No filter on her, basically someone who said the first thing that sprung into her head. And this was how she lived her life, as a sales rep for an important diaper company. In Paris, she added, no way, Rick said. We're going to Paris tomorrow, and we just came from Amsterdam. Elsa jumped back. Ew, Amsterdam is dirty. Paris is okay. You see, I'm half French, if you couldn't tell by my accent. We couldn't, I said. What? Everyone says I do. Well, I am, and I work in Paris. The only problem is I can't stand French people, especially the Parisians. All Parisians are the same, Elida said, nodding the side of her head at Elsa. Elsa didn't catch it and kept on her ramble till Rick asked her to quit and recommended some spots for us to check out. And asked her to recommend some spots for us. What a good idea, Elsa. Elida had perked up again, handed Elsa a pen and a coaster, and then slowly scooched her way to me as Elsa jotted down bars and street names over the coaster. I moved towards her too, and less than a beat, our legs intertwined, and her, our shoes came off to cross our toes and let our bare soles rub against one another until we smiled. Elida seemed so far along her life path, light years ahead, in another galaxy. She had graduated a few years back and shot straight to India, where she taught school children to read and write in English for two whole years in which time she had the luxury of traveling around the subcontinent at her leisure, picking up lessons and coming to conclusions about her life. Then, like most people our age, she said, I couldn't get the thought out of my head. I had to help other people. I would travel through India between semesters, but I couldn't, simply couldn't help the people that needed help. I couldn't do enough. It was never enough. So I turned to my studies and I reread Gandhi's essays and I finally understood what he meant with his famous crow. You know the one. I couldn't change the world, but I could change myself. After almost 24 months in a whole different culture, I flew back to my home country, joined a master's program in criminal psychology, and I've been working on my thesis ever since. What's your thesis about, I asked as my head found her lap. Generally about humanism, specifically about the cost to society of viewing criminals as non-persons. I suggest a more humane approach to treating prisoners in, well, prisons. Do you believe in God? I asked, almost interrupting her. I'm spiritual. I felt the need to ask for clarification, but was so strong so tipsy that I instead wiped the drool off my chin and sipped foam from the bottom of her beer glass, of my beer glass. When she was done, I noticed the corners of her mouth were curled upwards. I smiled too. And then I turned back to my beer glass and told her I thought she was working on something real cool. You should make eye contact when you talk, she said, patting the back of my head. Not only when you're listening, which you do well, but when you speak too, that way the listener can focus. I stood up in my seat. You mean like this? And I stared the blue out of her eyes pale, swirled in her waters, did freestyle laps around those irises, synchronized the freckles in her eyes with my own cobwebbed imagination, splashing as I swam down to her lips, then back up to her eyes, one, two, lips holding my gaze longer and longer each time till it got uncomfortable and then I held on a little bit longer. She asked me to tell her a secret. I don't know where I'm going. A lot of people don't. I didn't at your age. I was a mess. A hot mess. Elida stuck out her tongue. 
Does a flower ask where it's going? She doesn't need to know. She is rooted. You can be too. Just keep doing what you're doing and you will grow. We laughed. Then she brought me down to her lap again to talk some more. Only this time I felt unconscious and started dreaming about how we had seen each other on the train just the morning before. And there we were, one on top of the other, so tenderly, all because Rick and I had stumbled into a random bar that had been recommended by two random backpackers, or not random, but parallel, and between a series of necessary causes and effects, we were all living. So really, there was no simple way of knowing whether a light approved fate or not, but there was no other way it could have happened. The system we were always in and always would be. <laughs> the system we were in always was and always would be. Would you call your will free? Would you mark our presence absent? I had to walk up to a light on the train to have then had an excuse to talk to her at the bar. And she had to react to the feeling inside of me with a similar one inside of herself. Perhaps unpleasant, perhaps gracious, but a reaction nonetheless. Both of us sincere, acting the only way we could. If this sounds like gibberish, then it's probably because you're trying to understand life at a karaoke bar. We feel so alone, so alone. And then, in a single moment, we know just what to do. I fixed us the turn, Rick jumped to say. We're up next. He and I knocked back a shot of tequila and walked on stage to sing a standard of the karaoke genre. We wrecked the floorboards with our dance, inspired claps with our performance. What can make me feel this way? I sang to Elida. My girl, my girl, talk out loud, talking out loud. I've got so much honey, the trees envy me, Rick chimed in. And I, and I got a sweet song for you about the birds and the bees. Well, I guess you'd say, what can make me feel this way? I looked at Elida. Want to come back to my apartment? She asked. Limbs interlocked past the same pink and green solicitors by the same cathedral as the night before. And after an elevator, we entered a one bedroom. It was a tight, warm nook with a queen bed pulled apart into twins, sheets and shopping bags tossed carelessly about, and a beam of melancholy streetlight entering from an eastern window glazed in rainwater. A beam of changing colors, gleaming the ingot plate of a hairbrush left on a nightstand. No time spent on talk or nightcaps. The foreplay had been the day. Every conversation, every glance, every touch had been before this. For this. Her mouth tasted of apricot, rosemary, watermelon. Each tooth a new flavor. Was it the gum? She pulled out another stick. An eye, no rubber. But that didn't stop us. We went at it anyway. Plus, it was dark but the music our bodies made resonated the same, like two violin strings bowed by one arc. In tune, not even octaves apart, but fifths, fourths, then tonic, back to fifths. I pulled out and dribbled over her tummy, apologized. It's okay, she said, hugging me and sandwiching the fluids with our belly buttons. I want to show you something. And with that, she turned me over and proved it doesn't end that easily. Some things last more than once. Come back. A hundred seconds later, I was back on top, fiddling, woof, with dexterity, tapping the chords on the back of her hand like two scales of Cassiopeia keys. Squeak, her white throat bursting with the color of jacinth. Squeak, pulling over her chest covered in flechas, more fireworks shooting outside, Cries, screams, jazz festival beacons, and tambourine spasms. Palms to the wall, fingers down, knees up. Sheets crumpled, smiling exhales, gasping inhales. A car horn, 20 toes. Alida. Alida. Dahlia. La da a. La di da. Do re mi. Mi ca il. Me, do, a, la, you, all right? I, you, am. Yeah, yummy, om. Om. Alida was so much, so much more. 
She squeezed. I pulled out. A wad of kerchief brushed the top of our emptied fountain pen. Real life knotted up and curled under me, then unfolded. Looking up at a ceiling and seeing no wall, blind to a woven afterglow. A coda ensued, equally turned on and equally free, the two of us, you and me, blurry, out of focus, falling slowly, slowly falling, like the course of a river to a planet. In the world, nobody. In a word, hello. Then her phone rang. They chatted, yelled, while I, sidewinding, listened to the exchange of jagged and toothy consonants. A knock at the door broke the conversation. Elsa, wet from the rain, yet dry inside, locked her eyes with mine. You're not staying here. Elida walked me a block out in the right direction. Everything seemed dewy outside, cold, but at least it was the month of May. We faced one another. Sometimes some things were still real, and when I realized what, it wasn't too late. The backdrop to a foreign city crumbled between the cracks of its cobbled streets. I understood tonight wasn't about anything at all. It had just happened happily by happenstance. I looked Elida in the eyes again. She returned the favor. Her legs had goosebumps, were naked, exposed and glued to mine. No mind. It seemed only we two were out there in the rain, being served thick Belgian drops of water to bounce off our thought bubbles. But her eyes? We stood there staring into each other's eyes and watched the clouds of thoughtless silence swirl inside. Hers were oceans of waves of sapphire, violet foams and an azure breeze to cool. Mine were hazel green with toffee spots, wooded mirth and caramel drops. Together, we formed the planet Earth. Elida, Mikael, tell me a secret. She crossed her wrists behind my waist and with her lips pressed on my nose. I want to see you again. I kissed her forehead and thought of something good to say, but my ears were caught off guard by an inconvenient tear. A cacophony of oncoming vehicles and rusty windshield wipers cut open our isolation and swung among the rapid clash of rain droplets smashing against metal siding. The night express women shouted at us, told us lies in a third language, while boy toys and thing dogs sat and barrel rolled around the block, distracting us for an indiscernible pinch of time, cathedral bells ringing to remind us of that time. And so we held that hug a little longer. No more words for what felt like the last. Held one another's beating hearts on the opposite ends of our chest. Boom, boom, till we parted ways like Velcro and an unbearable melancholy of depressed gray matter of static electricity cue-balled us into opposite directions. Our respective paths the same as the night before. My hands were in my pockets, and I still didn't know a damn. Hopefully, the path ahead would reveal that which was worth her absence. Hopefully. <laughs> that concludes that chapter. I'll see you at the next one.